to come to our chief guest speech, Professor Richard Felder. Uh, but before I hand over to, to Professor Felder, just allow me a few moments to, to say a few words about uh, Professor Felder. So Professor Felder is a professor emeritus of chemical engineering at North Carolina State University. He has a, re a research work that expands numerous areas in chemical engineering. At the same time, he's also known for his work in engineering and science education. He authored more than 300 uh, scientific papers and several books. One of his books titled Elementary Principles of Chemical Processes is used widely in the United uh, States of America. In fact, uh, the stat statistics said that more than 90% of the American universities are using the, the, the book as an introductory book for chemical engineering students. Uh, I have the pleasure now to request our chief guest, Professor Richard Felder, to deliver his speech uh, to the audience. Please, Prof. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Prof. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wanted to make sure. I don't want to give a half hour talk and then find out that nobody was able to listen to me. So let me say that it is an honor for me to be here with you today. I greatly appreciate the kind comments about me that you made as part of the introduction. Um, I have looked at the uh, list of participants, of panelists, of the people who are going to be speaking. Um, I don't consider myself more knowledgeable than the people you're going to be listening to throughout this conference. There is a great deal of admirable expertise among these panelists. I've had the pleasure of working with uh, a couple of them, with uh, uh, Dr. Krishna Vadula is an old friend from Massachusetts and from India, with whom I've collaborated on a number of projects. Uh, Professor Zaki is uh, from Malaysia, is someone else that I've collaborated with in the times that I've been able to spend in Malaysia working at uh, UTM. And in looking at the list of topics that are going to be addressed as part of this conference, um, there are some of the things I'm going to be briefly talking about. Some people on the panel know a great deal more about than I do. And uh, I think that everyone watching this conference is in for a very, very educational experience. I have a couple of uh, comments that I want to make related to the theme of the conference. And uh, as part of that, I will, uh, let me see if I can share my screen. And I'm going to be going through a set of slides, but just by way of introduction, I'm going to be doing some, what we call crystal ball gazing. As all of you know, there are many global problems, serious global problems facing all of us now. And solving those problems is going to require a great deal of engineering and science expertise. And it's our responsibility as educators to equip students with the skills that they will need to successfully attack those problems. And so what I'm going to be doing in this talk is just briefly summarizing some of the problems that I see as important that we're trying to address, some of the approaches that have been taken in our educational systems to preparing students to solve those problems, and I'll make some predictions about how I think things are going to go in the next uh, 10 years or so regarding these different approaches that can be taken in education. So science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM education, current issues, and future directions. So I'm going to be talking primarily about engineering education because that's uh, what this conference is about. But Pretty much everything I say 
about engineering education can apply almost equally well to education in physics, chemistry, mathematics, computer science, and so forth. And so I'm titling this talk, not specifically engineering education, but STEM education. Uh, let's see. I wanna start with a uh, quote. And as a preface to that quote, I'll say that there are two different definitions of teaching. One definition of teaching is to present information to students. By this definition, if I cover material in a class, I have taught that class. The second definition is different. That defines teaching as causing learning to happen. So if I cover material in a class, but nobody learns it, according to that definition, I have not taught it. This is a picture of John Dewey, the great educational psychologist and uh, philosopher. And I let you read it. You can read faster than I can read aloud. I subscribe to the defi second definition of teaching. I don't consider that I have taught something <laughs> if no one has learned it. If I have taught it to a student and the student learned it, then I can say I've taught it. If I taught it to, if I taught it in a class and another student did not learn it, then I say I have not taught that student. And I'll be returning to that theme several times in the course of this presentation. And I'm gonna start by summarizing a number of pressures to improve engineering education that will be familiar to all of you, I think. And I'm gonna be presenting it primarily from a United States perspective because that's the perspective that I'm familiar with. Some of the things that I say will be applicable to the educational situation in Pakistan and uh, Malaysia and Bangladesh and in India and in other countries in your region. Others may not, others may be peculiar to America. So if I say something that uh, does not apply to your situation, feel perfectly free to ignore it. I suspect though, based on what I know of the region and the work that I've done in Malaysia and India, that most of these things you will find applicable to your system as much as they are to mine. So in the United States, particularly, student backgrounds have been broadening. In past decades, the ones who went into engineering were the cream of the crop. The ones who went to the very best high schools, got the best education, were successful in mathematics and science and so forth. And engineering education was designed to address those students. More recently, the base of students who have been entering engineering education has gotten much broader. It's not just the cream of the crop. It's not just the upper middle class and the children of the wealthy, but students from a wide variety of backgrounds have been coming into engineering with widely varying qualities of high school education. And that puts a great burden on, and this is a good thing, I am very happy about that development. The more people we can attract into our uh, system of education, engineering education, the happier I am. But if they come from a wide variety of backgrounds, that puts more pressure on us to adapt our teaching to meet their educational needs. Another uh, pressure on us to improve our teaching. Every year or two, a paper is published in which somebody went out and interviewed people in industry, managers, CEOs, who are hiring engineering graduates and asking those people, what do you find lacking in the engineering students that you've been hiring recently? And in all of these interviews, the student's ability to solve differential equations and design centrifugal pumps and phase shift amplifiers, uh, those are 17th on their list if they even show up at all. By and large, our employers are happy with our students, our graduates' technical knowledge. What they're complaining about is other skills 
that they don't think we're doing a good job of preparing our students with problem solving skills, thinking skills, critical thinking, creative thinking, entrepreneurial thinking, communication skills, their ability to write a coherent report on work that they've done and present a convincing persuasive oral presentation on work that they've done, they're finding those skills are lacking in the higher graduates they've been hiring recently. And they're holding us responsible for failing to teach those things adequately. And they have to teach them once the students are on the job. Computers are more powerful than ever now. All of you know that. And a consequence of that is that many of the jobs that engineers used to do routinely are now being done by computer technicians with smart computers. The routine jobs that can be solved algorithmically by substituting numbers and formulas, the computers can do those better and faster than we can. The problems that are really facing tomorrow's engineers are the difficult ones that don't lend themselves to simple solutions that need really innovative thinking to solve, thinking outside the box and critical thinking, making good judgments and backing them up. And the fact that the computers are taking away the traditional engineering jobs puts more pressure on us to be equipping students with those skills. Outcomes-based accreditation, OBE, the main topic of this conference is right at the center of the pressures that are being exerted on all of us to improve the way they teach. I don't have to tell all of you what OBE is. You know it better than I do. Most of you, I think, are in countries that signed the Washington Accord. You've been living with outcomes-based education, outcomes-based accreditation for years. And so you know that the old system of accreditation, which simply counted credits, bean counting, how many credits of design, how many credits of science, how many credits of general education, it was easy to pass those tests. You just count. When you're doing OBE, now you're not just looking at what are we teaching, you're looking at what are the students learning? What are the learning outcomes that you're trying to address in your engineering curricula? How are you assessing the students' abilities to meet those outcomes? What are you doing if you're finding a deficiency in how well they're meeting them? What are your plans to remedy their understanding, their ability to meet those outcomes? And that changes everything, as all of you know very well in education. And I'm delighted that you're gonna be getting talks from a number of experts in this conference on how you deal with those problems addressing OBE. Instructional technology has been improving. That's another development that's putting pressure on us to change. We can do a great deal with computers now to improve our teaching, right? We can provide online instruction. We can give students online tutorials that present them with information and give them quizzes on what they just learned and give them opportunities to go through the material again. That's powerful stuff. And it makes simply getting up and giving lectures as has been done for the last 150 years, uh, pale by comparison. And online courses and hybrid courses, which we've been forced into learning how to do because of the pandemic, it turns out that those have a lot of educational benefit but there's a lot of learning to be done to figure out how to do them effectively. And that's more pressure on us to change what we do. And finally, there's been a lot of educational research, good educational research in the last 20 years or so. And I'm not talking about the old kind of educational research in which somebody says, well, we tried this technique in our class and we really liked it and the students seem to like it too. And you publish a paper saying that. That doesn't qualify as research. That's just anecdotal, right? But real research, controlled research, where you have comparison groups and you're giving common tests and analyzing them systematically, that's been done. And all of the evidence in those things point to traditional teaching, lecture-based instruction is simply not effective at getting the learning that we're looking for. 
And at the same time, cognitive scientists have been learning a great deal about the brain and what goes on in our brains when we learn something and what conditions of instruction favor learning and what conditions of instruction hinder learning. And the cognitive science supports the educational research in showing that the way we've traditionally taught lecture-based instruction simply does not promote learning. In the book that uh, you refer, that they referred to that I wrote and in the paper that you've been referred to, I give references to both the educational research and the cognitive science. I invite you to check it for yourself and see if it helps convince you if you're not already convinced. So in the course of this talk, which I'm going to go through quite quickly, I'm going to address four questions. One, how should curricula be structured? Two, how should classes be taught? Three, who should do the teaching? And four, how should faculty be prepared to teach? And I'm going to be addressing four of those questions very quickly. And I'm going to be offering two paradigms, two different approaches to answering those questions. One is the traditional paradigm. That's the paradigm of teaching that's been used for 100 to 200 years. It's the way we were taught, those of us old enough to have gone to college before 20 years ago. And I'll contrast that with the emerging paradigm. That's what's been happening in the last couple of decades. And that's my prediction of the way our educational systems are going to be going in the decades to come. First question, how should curricula be structured? Traditionally, and that's what the T stands for, the emphasis is on content. We go through the content of the textbook, we write the equations on the board, we show how to derive and solve them, all right? We give the students exercises. After we've shown how to solve problems, we get the students to solve the problems, and we work our way through this material. That's content. And that's what most of our courses traditionally have consisted of. The emerging paradigm, and this gets us back to OBE, doesn't just focus on content. It focuses on learning outcomes. That's the key to driving everything we do in education according to the emerging paradigm. The outcomes include content, they include skills, and they include some students' attitudes towards their learning and instruction. Content of, is of course there. We can't lose content. It's always going to be there in what we cover. But we're also going to be looking at, um, okay. We're also going to be looking hands-on education hands-on skills, laboratory skills, computer skills. We're going to be looking at creative thinking. The traditional problems, as I said before, that can be solved by plugging numbers into formulas and algorithms, computers do those better than we do. We're going to have to find new ways of looking at problems, creative, innovative ways that have not been done yet. And we're going to have to teach students how to do that. Our traditional instruction doesn't do that. Critical thinking. So students are not just going to be able to have to have to derive formulas and plug numbers into them. They're going to have to make judgments. They're going to have to make decisions about alternatives that are presented to them and make judicious choices and then back them up with logic and with evidence. That's critical thinking. Our traditional instruction with the exception of a few enlightened teachers, doesn't touch that thinking skill. The emerging algorithm, the emerging paradigm is going to place a lot of emphasis on critical thinking because that's what they're going to need when they go out there into the real world. Communication skills, as I said before, their future employers complain bitterly, commonly, about how our students cannot clearly communicate the results of what they've done. We haven't in the past taught students to communicate clearly technical content. That's gonna be part of what we need to do in the future. Self-directed learning is gonna be another important skill. We teach, we get our students to be reliant on us 
to provide the information that they need to learn what we want them to learn. So we put examples on the board, we give assignments and we give grades and we give lectures on what we want them to learn. When they go out into the real world, when they get jobs and go to work in industry, we're not gonna be there. There are gonna be no teachers, no textbooks, no lectures, no homework assignments. All those students are going to have out there are problems, difficult problems. And all they're going to have by way of resources to confront those problems are themselves without teachers. They're gonna to have to learn how to do that stuff individually by themselves without the guidance that we provide them. And the other resource that they have is one another, their colleagues. And so an important part of the emerging algorithm is teaching them how to work in teams, high performance teams. As everyone in business and the real world knows, working in teams is not easy, right? Things don't just go smoothly. Very often there are conflicts, disagreements, personality differences between, uh, between team members, different levels of work ethic and so forth. And successful teams learn how to negotiate those problems. We have never taught how to do that systematically. Part of the emerging algorithm is using cooperative learning. In addition to teaching the content and the thinking and problem solving skills, we're gonna be teaching students how to work together in high performance teams. Next, how should classes be taught? Let's look at the organization of how we teach our classes. The traditional organization looks like this. It's top down. It's a deductive approach. We start out with the basic theory, the basic fundamental natural laws. We teach the mechanics course by giving Newton's laws of motion. We teach the thermodynamics course by starting out with the first law of thermodynamics, then the second law, then the third law, and so forth. We teach the transport course by giving the equations of change, the Navier-Stokes equations that basically describe everything that we're trying to analyze. And then once we have those equations derived, we start substituting into them and using them to calculate variables. That's the way that engineering has traditionally been taught almost entirely. The alternative, the emerging approach looks at it in a much different way. The emerging approach is inductive. Instead of starting out with a theory and deriving equations and substituting into them, you start out with challenges, with real world problems that need to be solved, with questions that you throw at the students that they're challenged to answer before you've taught them how to do it. And they have to attack those challenges and figure out you can't ask them to solve those problems because you haven't taught them how to do it yet, but they have to figure out what is this problem? Exactly what does it ask me to do? What do I need to find out in order to be able to take the first step? And once they identify that, you come in and teach them what they've identified a need to know, and then they go back to work on the problem, and then I identified a need to know more information, and you come in and teach that. So instead of going from theory to practice, you're going from practice, from real world observations and deriving the theory. And that's the way it was done in science. Science always starts is inductive. It always starts with observations. You measure something, you see what it is, you figure out why did it do that? That's not what's supposed to happen. And you formulate a better theory than you had before. Now, you may not have heard of inductive teaching methods, but you've heard of some specific inductive teaching methods, and you're going to be hearing about them in a talk later in this conference. Project-based learning is inductive, problem-based learning, inquiry-based learning, just-in-time education, service learning, all inductive approaches. That's the education of the future. Classrooms, what's the traditional classroom like? It looks like that. 
students are sitting there in nice orderly rows, uh, fascinated, obviously, by the lecture that they're listening to. And many of our classes, instead of looking like that, lately have started to look like this, right? Because it's economical. If I can get 300 students in one class, I only need one teacher for them. And uh, it, it, uh, I don't need the resources that I need for 30 different classrooms. And so you're seeing that more and more in the last 20 to 30 years, those two approaches to the traditional classroom. The classroom of the future, the emerging classroom, isn't going to look like those. You may still have some of those large lectures, but more and more of the classes are going to look like this. So this is a, the classroom of the future, and it's starting to show up at universities all over the world. I've been watching them happen. So you've got a bunch of tables with students sitting around them, and each table contains a student team. And they all have their computers, they all have their laptops, there are projection capabilities, they're all working on problems, the instructor is moving around, is answering questions, periodically getting the students to get up and report on what they've been doing. And that is the classroom of the future. Some of you may or may not have them now at your university, you will. Laboratories are dramatically becoming dramatically different from uh, what they used to be. The traditional laboratory, the ones that I had when I went to school in the late Jurassic period, the laboratories that most of you had probably, they were all teacher centered. The experiments were set up, you go into the laboratory, they give you just enough instruction in how to use the equipment to uh, guarantee that you don't destroy it. But the equipment is set up. They give you a, a protocol, a set of instructions to follow. All right. You pour from this flask into that one. You turn this knob over here. You adjust the flow rate to this. And you step through it. You record the data that it tells you to record. And then you uh, write it up. You write a report on it. And if you take data and the data don't agree with what you were supposed to get, you, uh, in, in the case of many students, you just change the data to match what you're supposed to, what you know you're supposed to get. The term we use in the United States is a cookbook laboratory. It's like following a recipe for a dish that you're cooking, step one, step two, step three. And typically, if you have 12 weeks for your laboratory course, you do 12 different experiments and write reports on them. The laboratory of the future, the emerging laboratory, doesn't look like that. Instead of being teacher-centered, where the teacher hands out instructions to do everything, it's student-centered. Now the instructor, the students come in and get instructions on what they're supposed to be measuring or what they're supposed to be proving or confirming. And they're given instruction and in, they're given equipment and they're given instruction in the equipment to make sure that they don't destroy it. That part is the same. But now it's up to them to design the experiment. It hasn't been designed for them. They have to decide what are we going to measure? How many runs are we going to do to get enough replication? Right? What are we going to do if something doesn't work? How are we going to adjust our experiment? If something happens that we're not expecting, then we got to figure out why. It doesn't say in the instructions that we were given. We've got to figure it out. And then after we've done that, we write a full report on it, uh, a, a technically correct report with literature citations, the whole thing. Because we're not just teaching them to run experiments. We're teaching them to be scientists and engineers and do the things that they do in the real world, which is all of that stuff. And now instead of 12 experiments in 12 weeks, I may have four experiments in 12 weeks. So I do fewer experiments, but I am learning almost an infinite amount more in the course of doing them. Maybe the same physical laboratories that I was working with before in the traditional approach. I may also be using technology 
So instead of an actual physical laboratory, I may have a simulated laboratory, possibly with virtual reality. And so in effect, I'm duplicating the, exper the experience that I would have if I were in an actual physical laboratory. The only difference is I'm turning controls on a computer instead of knobs on an actual physical system. And maker spaces are becoming increasingly common now in our engineering curricula. We're now all design a product of some sort. Uh, and now instead of just turning the design in and getting a grade for it, I'll go into the makerspace lab and make that product using a three-dimensional printer. And I'll test it and see if it's meeting its specifications. OK, let's go back into the lecture class. The focus of activity in the lecture class looks like this. There's the instructor up in front of the room lecturing for 50 minutes or 75 minutes or three hours or however long, long the lecture is. Essentially, all of the activity is up there in front of the room. The instructor talking, showing slides, writing things on the board or on the laptop and so on, occasionally asking a question and not getting an answer frequently and answering it herself. That's the traditional approach. And that was my entire college career. The emerging paradigm, the focus of activity shifts now. The instructor is still there teaching. That's not going away. But now uh, more and more of the lecture, of the time during the class is occupied by the students working, doing exercises, activities, sometimes individually, sometimes working in teams, sometimes working at computers on activities that the instructor assigned. And the activity may take only two minutes. There may be a problem that these students are asked to go through. And the instructor doesn't say, take 20 minutes and solve this problem. She says, I want you to get into pairs. Take two minutes. See how far you can go in getting this problem started. Go. And she turns them loose stops them after two minutes, calls on several of them to report on what they came up with. If they have questions, she answers them. Then she goes on and works through the rest of the problem with the students doing most of the work. It takes time, but the quality of the learning that takes place, that's active learning, that's what it's called. If they're working in teams, there's cooperative learning in there too. But the research base showing that active learning works better than lecture-based learning is so huge, there's so much research evidence in favor of it that Clarissa Dirks, who was the chair of a US National Academy of Science and Engineering Teaching Alliance, looked over the evidence and came to the conclusion that with what we know now about these two different approaches, it's unethical to teach in the old lecture-based system. Everyone should be using active learning because it just works better for causing learning to happen. Assignments and projects traditionally are done by individuals. And we tell our students, you've got to do this by yourself. If you get help from another student, you're cheating. <clears throat> the emerging paradigm gets away from that. Individuals still have things to do. We're not leaving individual assignments. Our students have to learn how to do things by themselves. But in addition to that, they may be assigned some projects and assignments in pairs and some in teams. Because as I said before, a big part of what we need to be teaching our students to do is work under the conditions they're going to be working in in industry. And nobody ever tells an engineer Here's a problem you have to solve. You have to do it by yourself. You're not allowed to work with or get help from anyone else. That has never happened in industry, and it never will happen. And the emerging paradigm recognizes that and recognizing that working in teams is a highly sophisticated skill. Students are not born knowing how to do it. Some of the time, we have to teach them how to do it. And that's the emerging paradigm. Instructional technology. Traditionally, technology meant showing PowerPoint. I'm using the traditional approach to technology right now. 
by showing you these slides. There's a second traditional alternative. Instead of watching me showing slides in a live classroom, I tape a lecture in which I show slides and the students sit at their computers at home and watch me lecturing. And that's still a traditional approach and it's inferior to the first approach because in a live class, at least they can raise their hand and ask me a question. If they're just watching a taped lecture, they can't even do that. The emerging approach makes full use of what technology can do. And technology for instruction is powerful. You can see lecture clips. Instead of watching a 50 minute lecture though, you can watch me lecturing for five minutes and then watch multimedia demonstrations of the things that I'm trying to teach about in pictures, in videos, the bridge collapsing over there. You can do all sorts of visual presentations. I can throw, show three-dimensional surface plots on the computer using instructional technology, showing how complex systems actually behave. I can show screencasts with my notes that students can go through, and if they don't understand something, they can go back and repeat it. And interactive tutorials where they watch a clip, then they get a quiz about what they just watched. And if they get a question right, they get a virtual pat on the back. If they get it wrong, they get corrective feedback and an invitation to try again. And they can do it as often as they need to until they've learned what you want them to learn. And you can have teams working separated by cities or states or countries or continents using email, screen sharing, threaded discussion. Right now we're doing it, all right? We could form teams right now. We don't have time to do it, but we could take everybody watching this, put them in breakout rooms, even though we're in separate countries and continents, we can do teamwork, solve problems together. And you can do that in any class you teach, no matter where your students are. Two remaining questions that I'll go through very quickly. One is who should teach? The traditional approach says, if you wanna be an engineering professor at a top university, you need to be a frontier researcher above all. You need to be doing research on the boundaries of what we know about engineering, about science. And you have to have a PhD to do that. You can't join the faculty if you don't have one. And you also may have to teach, but that's of secondary importance at top research institutions. The emerging paradigm recognizing that it recognizes that universities have many important functions, not just frontier research. And so the emerging paradigm is to recognize that we need several sets of skills on our faculty. We still need frontier researchers. We can't abandon that, all right? If there's gonna be frontier research anywhere, it's gonna be at the universities. Industry basically has almost abandoned frontier research with a few notable exceptions. If research isn't going to show a profit in the next uh, quarterly statement, then they're probably not gonna do it. We have to do it by default. We also need applied researchers who can take what the frontier researchers discover and put it to good use for society, for industry. We need some professional practitioners. We're supposedly training students to go out and be practicing engineers. Most faculty members in the traditional paradigm have never spent a day in engineering in their lives, but they're teaching students how to go out there and do engineering in practice. The emerging paradigm recognizes that at least some of our faculty members need to have been out there. And so we're looking for people who have 30 years of good industrial experience and they've retired from the industry and we're bringing them back to our faculties to share what they've learned, to be professional role models to the students. You don't need a lot of them on a faculty, but if you're training students to go out into industry, you need some of these experts to come back and share their knowledge. And if we're gonna be Introducing these new techniques, active learning, cooperative learning, project-based, problem-based learning, somebody on the faculty needs to know about those things. You need some of the people who are educational scholars 
who are doing research into those methods, putting them into practice, pilot testing them. So you may only need one or two of those in every department, but you need some to provide that expertise. And not everyone needs a PhD. The person who's been in industry for 30 years and is being a role model to the undergraduates doesn't need a PhD. They need the experience. And they all, all four of those categories need equal opportunities to advance. And finally, how should faculty be prepared to teach? The traditional model is not at all. I started teaching. I joined the faculty at North Carolina State. They welcomed me to the faculty. They said, uh, great to have you here, Rich. We're delighted you joined us. You're teaching 205 and 311 this semester. There's your office. Good luck. That was my preparation for teaching. I didn't have five seconds on how do you prepare lectures? How do you choose learning outcomes? What are learning outcomes? How do you create assignments and exams that are fair? How do you deal with students who are having problems learning? I had to learn all that by trial and error. It took years. It takes people years to learn how to teach effectively. The emerging paradigm says we don't have years because the people who are hurting from the mistakes that these new faculty are making are not the faculty who are making them, it's the students. And so the emerging paradigm says we've got to provide some training in this highly skilled profession. And the training may take the form of graduate courses and workshops for graduate students postgraduate students, postdoctoral fellows who are looking to enter faculty careers. It may take the form of faculty workshops, the kind that Rebecca and I, uh, Rebecca Brent and I have been doing for about 30 years uh, at different campuses and at conferences like the one you're having now, and learning communities that get together and study educational uh, teaching resource, resources, books, and so on, and mentoring, where experienced faculty members spend a month or a semester training new faculty members on how do you do this job, teaching together for a semester. And I've done a lot of that, and I can knock three years off a new teacher's learning curve by just two months of mentoring. Okay, that's the two paradigms. Here, there are a number of conclusions that I could draw, but I'm just going to draw a couple for you and then conclude my presentation. I'll repeat this. Educational research and cognitive science have shown conclusively that the traditional teaching method of I talk for 50 minutes and you're the student and you sit there and listen to me does not work. Some students learn, of course, we all learned, but we're the ones who went on and got PhDs and went on joined faculties. Most of our students, it doesn't work well for, and we lose a lot of them who would make excellent engineers if they were taught more effectively. And there are better ways of teaching effectively. We know what those ways are. We know what most of those ways are. And to equip STEM faculty members and engineering faculty members with those skills, we need to hire some of them on our faculties, not just frontier researchers, but people who understand these emerging methods of teaching and can apply them in their own classes and can pass them on to their colleagues who don't want to study pedagogy, but who really want to become better teachers. And we need to provide STEM-specific teaching workshops and courses that offer training in those methods. And on that, and it can be done, and it's being done at a lot of universities. I want to see it being done at a lot more. And anything that I can do to help any of you, you all have my contact information. <clears throat> my website has a lot of papers about this stuff. The book that they were kind enough to mention that Rebecca and I wrote, Teaching and Learning STEM, a Practical Guide has information about all of the techniques that I've mentioned in the emerging paradigm here. And all of you are welcome at any time. If you have a question or you wanna run an idea by me, send me an email. I promise I will respond to you. I might not get my response to you in five minutes, but I promise you will eventually get it. 
And on that note, let me thank you again for the honor of talking to you today. And I wish you the best of luck with the rest of the conference and in your education careers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, it was really nice and valuable speech. And uh, I, I think we, we all agree with the, everything you have said. Uh, I personally I find that, you know, that the, the kind of experience that we have uh, now and that the kind of belief that we all have reached after years of, of teaching and dealing with the students. I think we, we have uh, some time for, uh, to take few few questions. Uh, I already received some questions here in the, in the chat box. So if, if, you, if possible, Prof, can we take a few questions before we end? Certainly, no, I'd be happy to. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so first question is coming from Musharraf Hussein. He says, are the students or uh, must the student have some sort of standard to achieve the outcomes? Uh, are all the qualities, okay, I tried to read that, are, okay, yeah, the question again, um, do or must the student come with some qualities before they join uh, the university, if I understand the, 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 the question correctly, and also, uh, can they learn all the qualities that we decide we want to teach them? Uh, can, is it a must for them to learn everything? Please correct me, uh, Musharraf, if uh, I misstated uh, your question. Okay. Um, do they need to have some standards? Uh, yes, they do. They need to. Uh, they need to have a work ethic, because. Even when you're using the new teaching methods, there's a lot of work that you have to do. Um, and a lot of the work you have to do yourself or working with others. And if a student doesn't want to do the work, no matter how good your teaching is, they're probably not going to succeed. On the other hand, having said that, many of them never really learned good work habits when they were in high school. And at my university, and I hope at most of your universities, there are people there, there are counselors who can provide assistance to students who are having difficulty struggling, who don't really know how to study or how to cope with the demands that are being placed on them. And if the students are willing to learn and they're willing to consult those counselors and advisors, even if they don't have all of the necessary skills and attitudes coming in, they can learn to acquire them. And they may struggle for the first semester, but as long as they're paying attention and do the necessary work, they'll succeed. Another part of that question was, can we teach them everything? And the answer is very simple. No, no, uh, we can't teach anybody everything. The good thing though, is you don't have to teach them everything. And it's impossible to teach them everything because there's far too much to teach. What we need to do is focus on what is really important for them to learn. And I don't wanna to take too much time on this, but it's, we spend a lot of time on this in the workshop. There's two categories of information, which I call the need to know information and the nice to know information. Need to know information is what they are, what it sounds like. They're gonna to need to know this. It's gonna be on the exams, the teachers who teach them in the class after hours are going to assume that they know how to do those things. That's the information that we've got to make sure, do everything we can to teach them. The other category is nice to know information. It's not part of our learning outcomes. We're not going to put it on the exams, but we just like teaching it. Or we think that some, uh, eventually all students should be exposed to these complex equations and so forth. What a lot of teachers do is they spend a lot of time on the nice to know information and they don't have enough time to get to all of the important need to know information. What we need to do as teachers is be careful to identify for each thing we teach, which category is this in? 
we identify all of the need to know information and we make sure that we cover it adequately in our class. And then if there's any time left over, we can put some of the nice to know information in. So you don't have to teach everything, but you make sure you allow enough time to teach the things that you really do need to teach. Okay, thank you, Prof. <clears throat> I hope that, that that answered the question. Uh, I, I have uh, more than one question. I, I try to, to combine together. And these questions are about the resources. You, you, you made a comparison between traditional and uh, emerging uh, things, you know, the, in teaching, like the, the technology, the mm -hmm. outcome-based education, as an example, the way we prepare working groups. Uh, all these uh, proposals, they require resources. And there's mm -hmm. always a question about uh, available resources. So, for example, there is a worry from our side, we, the staff, that we will take most of the burden coming from moving from, from tra traditional to modern uh, ways of thinking you know we, we have a kind of management that require us to, to use technology without paying for the technology to be offered in, 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 the, right. in the first place so there's there's a real worry from from the staff is that much of the burden of this will be placed on on the lecturers so we will right. still have the, the the class with many students but we still have to do like one-to-one -one or uh, active learning and you know which, which takes time and, and, and yeah. Of yeah so okay. how, how to manage this yeah that, no that's a that's an excellent and a very important question when uh, when dr brent and i give a workshop we offer lots and lots of ideas and at the end of the workshop we make this little speech to the workshop participants okay look you've just spent the last day and a half in which we've given you 188 ideas about things that you should do to be a better teacher. What we are not telling you is go out and start implementing all 188 of them starting next Monday morning. That's a prescription for disaster. You can't possibly do it. And you're going to be trying to do too many, so many new things at the same time you're not going to have confidence in a lot of what you're doing. The students are going to smell your fear. It's not going to end well. Here is what we propose you to do. And this is still part of the speech I'm giving the workshop participants. Go through the notebook. Go through all of the suggestions that we made. And in the next class you teach, identify one or two new ideas, things you haven't done before that meet two criteria. One, it looks reasonable to you. You look at it and you say, yeah, I could see that if I did that, it would probably improve my teaching. And two, it looks like something you could do without undergoing a personality transplant, all right? So if it's something that looks reasonable and looks like you think you could do it, then maybe pick that one and maybe pick one other one. And in the next class you teach, try doing those things just those two. Give them a fair try. Don't just try active learning once and the students just look at you and say, what are you, you must, you can't be serious. And you say, well, that didn't work. You've got to repeat it. You got to do it several times so that both you and they can get used to it. And then see if it's working. And if it's working for you, keep doing it. And if it isn't working for you after you've given it a fair try, then drop it. Next semester, next course you teach. There's no rush about this. Pick one or two other ideas and try them. And if they keep, if they work, then keep doing them. If they don't, then drop them. And if you do this, I give you a guarantee, your teaching is going to steadily improve. And that's what you want. You don't have to transform your teaching completely so that you go from being an average teacher to the best teacher in the world. Just take it one step at a time. Now, the problem that you raised there about resources. Some of the suggestions in the emerging paradigm definitely take resources. If you're going to build a, a computer equipped, a technology equipped classroom with the round tables and the laptops and the projection capability, that costs a lot of money. 
and you need the resources to do it. But if you're going to take a class that's been entirely lecture and start doing some activities in it, convert it to active learning, that takes zero resources. You can just go in and start doing that tomorrow. Now, there's a few, few things you need to learn about how to do active learning because there's some mistakes. And in, in our book, we talk a lot about that. Here are the uh, pitfalls to avoid if you're doing active learning. But if you do this, this, and this, and you don't do that, active learning will work for you. And you put no resources in. And there's also tips on how you don't have to take any additional time, like getting rid of a lot of the nice to know material, just focusing on the need to know material. And every one of your teachers at your university can do that starting next week with no additional expenditure for resources. And so what you do again is take it slowly, identify the things that you can do without a lot of resources that are easy to do, but research shows they work a lot better. And then be working to raise the resources that you need to do the more expensive things. And it may be five or 10 years before you can finally manage to get all that technology in there. But as long as you keep working steadily on it, and hopefully the financial situation will approve, improve, uh, eventually it'll be done. But the key is take it slowly. Thank you, Prof. Yeah, I think, I think that that's a, a very important message. Uh, yeah, we need to evolve rather than have a revolution, right? Perfect, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, before we close, I think we can take one last question. Uh, this is from Bish Uh The question is about um, the eth ethical practices of students. You know, I, I think he is, is talking about how to protect the coping of assignment, uh, how to control uh, the students not to copy from each other. This is, I think, maybe a global problem, probably. I don't know about the United States, but Boy, very yeah. bad problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a very hard problem, and nobody has come up with the answer to it mm -hmm. yet. But there are approaches to doing it. One of them um, is the so called algorithmic problem. Like my textbook in chemical engineering, Elementary Principles of Chemical Processes, uh, it's been uh, it's been used for uh, about 45 years now. First came out in 1978. It's got 700 something problems at the end of it. You can go online now and get the answer key to every one of those problems. And all students know this, instructors know it, but they're now developing software so that instead of getting the problems from the back of the book, the students go online they sign in because there's a there's an account for them. They're all registered with the instructor. They all go to that problem, but the problem is a little different for every student who logs in. The value variable values are different. Some of the conditions are different and so forth. So they can't just copy somebody else's solution. They have to at least work through the solution with their particular set of variable values. It's not an entirely satisfactory solution. And if a student wants to cheat badly enough, they'll probably figure out a way to do it. But at least it's a step in the right direction. And if, if you or anybody you know there comes up with the definitive answer to that problem, please pass it along to me. Okay, thank you very much, bro. Yeah, I think that that's a headache for everyone uh, who's yeah. teaching, yeah. Okay, I, I, you know, I would like to to apologize for the for the for not ask, uh, giving the chance to answer the, the other questions. We, we already received more questions. I think we already run out of time, and it's getting too late for Professor Richard Felder. We we thank him, <laughs> and we apologize for keeping him for for yeah for so long and up to this. Uh, well, it's it's uh, been a it's been a great pleasure for me, and once again, good luck to all of you. Okay, yeah. So, so this this session, uh, this is this will end the inaugural session. Uh, but before I, I close, I would like to uh, ask everyone to turn the camera so that we take uh, like a photo just to yeah to uh, to remember this moment. Uh, so please turn turn your camera on and uh, just for for a minute.
Okay, that, that's all. Thank you very much, everyone. All done now. Uh, thank you, Professor Richard. Uh, you are thank welcome. you. Good, good, uh, good morning to all of you and good night from me. Yeah, good night. Good night.